Hey, I'm going to pray and then uh, we'll get into God's Word together. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we thank You this morning. It's been so powerful, actually, just in that worship, Lord. I just, I don't know what it is, but there's always, I've always said this, God, there's a hunger here, uh, a hunger for You, and that's good, and it's important, and You value that. And, uh, and that's what You want for our lives, a hunger and thirsting after You. And Lord, I was just reminded in that worship, um, just how good You are and how incredible You are. And Father, we just uh, thank You for Your goodness, Your love and Your mercy. And I thank You, Lord, that You're such a gracious God that, that uh, longs to be engulfed in our lives. You're a relational God. And I'm really convinced as well, Father, that Your Word is powerful. Uh, time and time again, it speaks to our lives and it's incredibly relevant. And I really just pray, Lord, that this morning would be no different, that you'd open our hearts up for what you want to say to us. There's things that you want to say to us this morning. And I pray that as you speak, we'd be bold and courageous enough to be obedient to it uh, so that we'd leave here as a changed person. We'd leave here uh, with a heart and a desire to say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you've asked me to do. That's what's key and that's what will bear fruit in our lives. So, Father, um, please, uh, please speak to us this morning and we're open to what you want to say to us. So we commit these things to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to read uh, to you actually this passage that I'm going to preach from this morning. I want to read it to you up front. It's such a uh, powerful passage and it's from James 4. It may come up <clears throat> on the screen. Uh, but it says this in James 4, uh, starting in verse 13, going through to verse 17. It says this, so powerful. It's a great book, the book of James. He says, Now listen, you who say, right? Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to uh, this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He says, Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? So powerful, these words. What is your life? He says, you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, he says, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't, do it, it is a sin for them. Now, this is strong, like this is powerful words, but this is what I love about James. He does not muck around, like he just says it as it is. And it's such a challenge, hopefully to you, it's a, certainly a challenge to me, as he writes some uh, powerful words uh, to us this morning. Such a, such a challenge, such a challenge, but such an encouragement as well, if we're willing to walk uh, in it. Now, uh, many years ago, uh, some of you uh, are aware of my journey and my story to faith. I'm not going to necessarily focus on that part of it. And I think I shared last time I was preaching here a bit of my own journey coming to faith. Uh, but I want to share a little bit of my journey coming into ministry, actually, like sort of full-time, you know, professional ministry uh, or whatever that looks like. Uh, but, um, uh, but working full-time for a church. And how that sort of evolved was I came to faith and some of you are aware of that story, but I had a radical transformation and, and I just knew as soon as I came to faith, like God had, God had saved me. You know what I mean? Like that's the best way I can describe it. God has saved me. And I just felt like, I remember just going, God, you're so good. I want to tell people about you for the rest of my life. Like that's what I'm going to do. And I didn't necessarily intend like, oh, I'm going to work full time as a pastor in a church. I just said, I want to tell people about you for the rest of my life. You're that amazing. And so uh, I was doing carpentry at the time. Yeah, came to, just started my apprenticeship in carpentry, came to faith. I was about 18 and a half and I was doing carpentry and uh, I had all these plans. I actually really enjoyed building and I loved that. And I had all these plans. Um, uh, so I wanted to do my apprenticeship. I wanted to do, then go on to do my builder's license, which I started about as a third year apprentice, fourth year apprentice. I was doing TAFE at night, doing my builder's license to get my low rise certificate. And then uh, through my early years of coming to faith, I met a guy in the church that was, uh, did a lot of property development uh, in his lifetime. And I'd often talk with him and he sort of mentored me a little bit. And, and I knew I wanted to get into property development. So I wanted to get my builder's license and then do property developments and build specky homes and all this sort of stuff. Like these were my plans, right? And so I had all this, this lined up, all this plan. I'm actually quite a, a, like I'm a goal setter. And so I was like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. And so uh, as it went on, I think I'd finished my apprenticeship. I got my uh, builder's license. But at the same time as this was going on, I was very involved in the church because, because God had saved me. I said, well, the least I can do is give my life back to you. Like that's the very least I could do. You were massacred 
on a cross for me. So the least I could do is give you my life, right? Like that's the very least we could do. And so um, I said, well, God, I want to serve your house as well. Like, uh, and so I was involved in the local church and things like that, putting out chairs every week, whatever, whatever was needed. I loved uh, helping out. And around that time, I had some opportunities to do announcements. Uh, Nathan, who's now senior pastor, was young adults pastor at the time, and he was running young adults. And I had some opportunities to, he said, do you want to do announcements at a young adult service on a Wednesday night? And there's probably like 20 or young ads that would gather on a Wednesday night. And I was petrified, you know what I mean? Because public speaking is terrifying. Like, it's really scary. And I was so scared and I spent a whole week, you know, working on these four announcements that I had to mention uh, on Wednesday night. And I spent a week and I prayed and I don't know if I fasted, but it was terrifying, you know, it was so scary. And um, so anyway, uh, I had an opportunity that and then one day it came for an opportunity to preach on a Sunday night and I was terrified, like so scared. I failed everything at school because I couldn't do an oral presentation in front of my class. So how was I going to preach? But it's a funny thing, isn't it? God takes the weaknesses of our lives and uses them for his glory. And it's amazing because you can never take credit then. People go, wow, what a great sermon. I say, it, it's literally the, the grace of God. It literally is. He turns our mess and turns them into um, trophies of his glory. It's just amazing. He's such a great God. And so I had this opportunity to preach and I just thought, oh my goodness. And I preached that night and something really significant happened. Sorry, I get actually a bit emotional, but uh, I caught a response that night and 15 people came to faith. Just, you know, people that even today are still walking strong. Their lives were transformed. One man uh, had planned on committing suicide. But he came that night and he found new life in Christ. Just a remarkable story. Actually, he's on Hope Stories podcast. Uh, but um, uh, just an amazing story. And I just thought, wow, like God's amazing. I went back to carpentry that week. But on the Tuesday, Nathan uh, texted me and said, hey, if you've got time this afternoon, I'd love you to drop into the office. Me and Pete, who Pete was senior pastor at the time, we'd love to catch up with you. And I was, I was so scared. I thought, what did I say? Like, I'm in so much trouble. They're going to drag me over the coals. I'm, I'm in so much trouble. And I went that afternoon, fear and trembling, you know, walking into the office. And they both sat me down, Pete and Nathan in the office. And I thought, oh, no, you know. And they said, oh, we just thought we'd reflect on the sermon and stuff. And I'm like, oh, OK. Now, unbeknownst to me, the church council had been praying whether or not they should call me as an intern pastor. Now, this wasn't in my plan whatsoever. And they said, they said, look, it was a great sermon. God really moved. And we feel like it's a real confirmation because unbeknownst to you, we've been praying for God to give us a sign, uh, you know, for you to come on board as an intern pastor. And we really feel like Sunday night was a significant sign for us. You know, these people come into faith and, um, you know, Pete's funny. He's got this great story. He talks about how God humbled him through that because he, he said that night he had this feeling like, whoa, you know, I've been a senior pastor here for 20 years and 15 people have never come to faith when I've preached, you know. And so he says it was a humbling moment. But but, uh, uh, but, but they said, so we really feel you should come on board as an intern pastor. Now, now what do you, how do you think I responded in that moment? So I'm sitting there, and this is the first time. I, I wasn't even thinking this was on the cards. Now, I knew I wanted to tell people about God for the rest of my life, but pastoring wasn't in the, the spectrum of things. And so I just sat there, and I just said, you know, I just said, no. <laughs> no way. <laughs> like, flat out. Like, they just said, we want you to come on board. I said, no. Like, I don't want to be a pastor. Like, who would want to be a pastor? You know what I mean? And, uh, and so I said, no, no. But I said this. It's a really, it's a famous line. You've got to be careful. Because I said this, I said, but I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. And, and I really did. Like, I went away. And I, I distinctly remember, because I can still remember the first set of lights I got to. And as I'm driving up those lights, I just got out. And I just said, God, like, I don't want to do. Like, this isn't, do you know what I said? I said, this isn't part of the plan. You know what I mean? Like I said, I've got plans. You know what I mean? I've got plans. And I knew, I was very clear on what I was going to do. They didn't know this, but the, the, the week before I'd caught up with this financial advisor and this, this broker guy, and he'd literally just, we'd just gone through all my finances and worked at it all, and he said he'd just give me the okay, right? We're going to approach banks about doing my first little small property development, buying my first house, renovating and all this sort of stuff. So it was good to go. Like I was ready to go. And I said, God, like, I don't want to do this. Because they said, oh, we want you to, you know, pull back and do a day here, a couple of days and then go to Bible college and all this sort of stuff. So I remember driving home just saying, God, no, no. I, I, I've got plans. That's what I said. I've got plans. I want to do, I want to finish my builder's license and I want to start doing this development. 
but I prayed. And over the next two weeks, I really, really prayed about it. And there were some significant things that happened. See, you've got to be careful, eh? It's amazing. <laughs> but there were some significant things. God spoke to me several times through his word. And um, you, know, you know what's fascinating? The very scripture, the very devotion that God gave me, uh, that I was like, okay, Lord, I think you're in this, was my devotion this morning. That very word this morning. I, I opened up this morning. It was actually that very word. And he spoke to me. But there was another thing that he spoke to me one day, I remember, just in my spirit. I really felt like God, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard him say, because I wanted to develop land, like property and all this sort of stuff. And he said to me on another occasion, he said, David, do you want to develop land or do you want to develop my kingdom? And I was like, oh, gee, like, okay, like, what do you say to that, you know? Oh, no, Lord, land. Um, <laughs> now, uh, now it's like, if you do that, that's fine. And, and I, I don't want to, that's your call. Like, if you really feel that God's called you to that, that's your call. But for me, I'm just saying for me, for me, God said, I want you to pursue this other thing. I want you to go into full-time uh, ministry and I want you to pursue that. And so I surrendered to that. Now, it was difficult for me. I really admit that because I love work on the job site. I love working with rough tradies. I mean, the opportunities to share on the job site, it's amazing. You know, sharing with trades and stuff. And I'd invite them to church. And they'd often say, mate, I'd rather eat my own spew than go to your church service, you know. And, and, but I love that. You know, that's just, that's just the society we live in today. And, and that's uh, maybe not everyone, hopefully not. Uh, but, um, but I love being on the job site. But I surrendered that and I said, okay, God, I'm in. And I really struggle with that. But it's a funny thing, isn't it? And the rest is history. But I remember distinctly saying, I've got plans. I don't want to do that because I've got plans. And this is what James is saying here. He's saying, and you're the same. Like, let's be honest. We've all done it. We've all done that. There's no, I don't think there's anyone in this room that could possibly say, oh, I've never thought to myself, like, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. We've all done it. And what James is saying is saying this. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or spend a year or there, carry on business and make money. He says, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You don't even know. But we live in this concept. We live our lives in this, this setting. I don't know about you, but I do it all the time where I think, oh, tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or five years or 10 years. You know, someone asked me recently, sat down with me and they said, oh, what's your 10-year vision? And I was just honest with them. I said, mate, to be honest, I'm not even thinking that far ahead. Like I've got today. That's about it. Like I've got to. I said to him, I said to him, mate, I could be dead next week. Now, you might say, whoa, that's morbid. Like, like, but, but honestly, I, I, I'm convinced I know where I'm going. I, I don't think it's morbid because there's a, I'm, I'm hope-filled. I'm absolutely hope-filled that I know where I'm going. And this isn't my home, but this is what happens. We live like it is. We live like, oh, tomorrow and next week. And we, we plan. We're constantly planning. And we're scheming up all these ideas and concepts that we think that we have for our lives. And, and God's like, no, your life is not your own. What you need to really ask is, hey, it's not about my plans, but what are God's plans for my life? Because we were bought with a, we were bought with a price. It was a costly one. It's not about us. And James, this is what he's saying. He's saying, don't live like that. Don't live with... Now, it's okay. You may get visions for the future. God's laid on my heart, absolutely, for long-term visions, things that I think he will call me into in the future. But, you know, I hold them very loosely. I just go, all right, God, okay, I think this is where you call me in the future, but I'll put it on the shelf. And today is all I've got. So I need to ask you today, what's your plan for me today? What's your plan? Not my plan. What's your plan for me today? And we need to walk in that. There's a huge difference between like a good idea and a God idea. Like you can come up with good ideas all the time. We, we do it all the time. We do it in ministry. That's the scary thing. You can be in full-time ministry and you do, you do lots of good ideas and you run good events and you run good programs, all this sort of stuff. But is it God's events? Is it God's plan? Is it God's purposes? That's the key. Because you can be busy doing a lot of stuff a lot of stuff, but they may not be God, uh, God's, God's stuff. They might be God ideas. And so James says, be careful. Don't say today or tomorrow. Don't, don't, don't say, oh, we're going to do this and spend a year there. We're going to make money. We're going to do all these things. What you need to say, if this is God's will, we'll do those things. But, but, but I need to discern. I need to know, is it my plan or his plan? That's what I need to know. And so lately, I'm conscious of this. Lately, I'm trying to, I wake up every morning and say, all right, God, what, this is what I say lately. I say, God, Okay, what's your, what's your plan today, Lord? Just like that. Just say, what's your plan? What are, we, what are we up to today? What do you want to do? 
Who do you want me to phone? Who do you want me to drop in? Who do you want me to see? Who do you want me to catch up with? What's your plan? What's your plan today? Because you can, let's be honest, you can do an entire day absolutely flat strap and come home at the end of the day, just be exhausted and wrecked. I was so busy today. But how tragic to get to the end of a day or get to the end of your life and say, I was so busy, but I did nothing that God wanted me to do. How tragic. Had very, it had zero eternal significance. That is a tragedy. Absolute tragedy. And James says, you've got to be so careful, so careful. We've got to get our focus on, on an earthly mindset and onto an eternal mindset, onto a kingdom mindset. John Piper says this, it's out of his book, actually. His book is called Don't Waste Your Life. And John Piper says this, he says, I am wired by nature to love the same toys that the world loves. How true. I, I struggle with that all the time. He says, I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. And before you know it, I'm calling, this is challenging. He says, before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs and using my money just as the way that unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. Now, the war he's talking about is the, the spiritual war that we're involved in. I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about people perishing. Missions and unreached people drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace. I sink into a secular mindset that looks first to what man can do and not what God can do. It's a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again toward a wartime mindset. It's a great quote and it's a challenge. And it's a challenge to me because I, I, I fall into this all the time. But I think we all do from time to time. We think our work's about ourselves. We think our business is about making money for ourselves. We think our houses for ourselves. We think our cars are about ourselves. We think all that we do is all about us and it's not. We are literally, you know what we are? We're stewards of what God has given us for the kingdom of God, not for ourselves. So we've got to, and we've got to think through an eternal mindset. Eternal mindset. Two weeks ago, um, it, it had been raining. Funny that, still raining. But uh, it had been raining a lot. And uh, actually, by the way, tomorrow, I just checked the weather. Um, tomorrow says it's going to be sunny. So um, don't worry about the dry. You can hang the clothes out on the line. Uh, but, um, but it had been raining heaps two weeks ago. And, um, and it, I think it was a Saturday morning. It was Saturday morning and, and there was this shiny thing in the sky. It was like this sun. It warms you and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And, um, and so I said to my wife, I said, oh, we should take this opportunity. Maybe we'll take the kids. and Because they'd been cooped up for a couple of weeks. And let's go out. And she goes, yeah, we'll go down to Sandgate. And we'll just walk along the waterfront there down at Sandgate. And I thought, that'd be awesome. Let's do that. She goes, we'll take the scooters and the bikes and stuff and we'll go down. So we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll quickly do that. Now I've got a six-year-old, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And, you know, just quickly, five minutes, we'll just throw everything in the back of the car and go down. So an hour later, um, <laughs> we, uh, we finally get in the car. Yeah, the kids in the car and we go down to Sandgate. And, you know, it's amazing down there because there's, you know, fish and chip shops and cafes and it's such a great atmosphere down there and the sun was shining and everybody was out and there's great playgrounds and, and, uh, and not only that, but people are walking and exercising. It's just such a great atmosphere down there. And so we're there in the playground with the kids and they got their scooters and stuff and we're just having a good time and I'm just looking around and we've got our coffees and stuff, you know, and, and I had this thought, you know, as I'm looking around, I had this thought, I could live here, you know, I could live here. Like we, we, we should live here because it's just such a, a great environment. And then I mentioned to my wife, you know, wouldn't it be great to live here? All of a sudden I'm just thinking, and, and, and what I've probably hadn't thought about it for, you know, ages before, like hadn't thought about it at all. But all of a sudden we're there and I'm just thinking, yeah, all of a sudden we need to live at Sandgate or we need to live at Brighton. And, and you know, and so I said to my wife, I said, you know, imagine if we lived here and not that we're asking for much, God, you know, we, we'll just pray about it. God, we don't, we don't even need ocean views. Like even if we... Maybe, maybe ocean glimpses would be nice. Um, but even just walking distance to the waterfront would be great. And then we started to talk about, you know, wouldn't it be great, like the lifestyle and, you know, the kids could come home from school and we could just walk down to the waterfront and we could take them for a scoot or ride along the waterfront. That would be great. Imagine the lifestyle. It would just be amazing. Now, if you, if you live there, well, good on you. I know, that's, you know, it's amazing. But, but we started to, and all of a sudden, we just thought, no, that's what we need to do. We need to live at Sandgate. You know, if you're selling, come and see me afterwards. Um, but but um, 
but it's fascinating how we spiritualize things. And, and, you know, all of a sudden I just thought, and, you know, like it's important and it's good and it'd be great for us as a family and all this sort of stuff. And, it, and, and I started to think, you know, I could start a ministry here, you know, like a running ministry. Like I hate running, you know. The only running I do is to the fridge, basically. And, and, and like I hate running, but we spiritualize it. Oh, I could start a ministry, you know, a running ministry at Sandgate and whatever, God. Like, like it'd be for you, God, you know. And... Uh, but I just, I just thought, all of a sudden, I'm scheming up these ideas and concepts. We need to live at Sangata. We need to live at Brighton and all this sort of stuff. And James is saying, what, what are you doing? Like, like, like listen, you, you say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city or spend a year there, carry on business, make money. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Like, what we need to discern, is this God's, like, is this God's plan for us to live there? Or is it just my plan because we're here now and it's awesome and all that sort of stuff, you know? Like, that's what we need to know. That's what we need to show. And we need to walk in that. And it's funny, isn't it? Because God's plan for your life is the best life. Like, that's the funny thing. We, we think we push against God all the time because we want to be in control and we want to do what we want to do. I don't know about you, but I'm selfish. Like, I'm selfish. At the core, I know deep within my heart. And, the, and, and getting married and certainly having kids, you go, wow, I'm really selfish. Like, like, like I just want to do what I want to do all the time. And I wrestle constantly, battle with that. And so we do that with God as well. We go, no, God, I want to do this. Like, I'm going to do this. And it's funny because we think, you know, God, I know what's better. But he loves you so much. He's got the best life for you. And it's really tragic, actually. Because he's like, are you kidding me? I'm your heavenly father and I'm a good father at that. And I don't call you to surrender things or to do things because I've, you know, got a terrible plan for your life. It's because I've got a good plan for your life. And, and how tragic to miss out on that because we just get so selfish. We get so earthly focused and we, we, we lose sight of the kingdom. We need a kingdom focus. We need to get our heads off ourselves and onto the world around us and onto the people around us and onto the kingdom of God. Now, like I said... Like I said, it's so easy to be like, okay, get so fixated on your vision for what you want to do rather than God's vision. Like I said, coming into ministry, I, I had plans. Now, you've done this. You've done it in your business. You've done it in your workplace. You've done it in your home life. You've done it where you live. You've done it in how you're going to make money. You've done this. You've done this. You said, oh, this is what I'm going to do. But what we need to do is say, okay, God, what is your plan? What is your plan for my life? I need to walk in that. And, you know, James says it's funny because you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. So some of you may have five-year visions. Now, like I said, it's not bad to have that. Maybe God's birthed a vision, a God vision on your heart. And, yes, you look forward to those things. But really, he says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Have you ever been in situations where maybe you've been anxious or fearful or worried, concerned about something coming up? And you get so fixated on it and so caught up on it, like... I hadn't heard this before, but it's becoming more prominent in our culture. And a friend recently told me that uh, she gets anxious about getting anxious. You know, and it, this is huge in our culture today, uh, that anxiety and depression is running rampant. Um, but she said, I even get anxious about the thought of getting anxious about something, like in the future. It just runs rampant. But, but have you ever been in situations where you're fearful or anxious about something? And then, you know, a week comes by, two weeks, and then it doesn't even unfold anyway. And sometimes we live like this. We're fearful of something that might happen, but it doesn't happen. And this is what James is saying. And Jesus says the same thing. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. So what we need to do is try to live. And I know it's difficult, but try to live in today. Just go, God, all I've got today. So what's your plan today? What do you want to do today? Let, I'm in God. I'm in God. What's your plan? Um, actually, and I didn't do it. So this is, a, this is a downfall. Don't do this. But I was just reminded... I rang tomorrow on fr uh, Thursday, Thursday it was, and, and I was driving to work because I'm trying to do this every morning, and, um, and it was a really like, busy week, and I, the night before now, I'm, I'm conscious about saying, all right, God, what's, what's tomorrow, and, and I just jot down, okay, I've got to do this, 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 and I just put it so that my day is somewhat fruitful, but I've still got to be careful about, is this what you want to do? And as I was driving to work on Thursday morning, I said, okay, God, what's the plan today? What are we doing today? Let's go. What are we doing? And um, I felt like you said to me, oh, I just want to spend some time with you. And I thought, oh, like, because the natural reaction is, oh, I want to be really busy. Like, I want to be productive. Like, I want to do stuff for you, God, you know. And he said to me that morning, he said, oh, I just want to spend some time with you. And I thought, oh, okay, that was different. I thought I was going to be like all in, like going, going hard for the day. And I was like, okay, I can do that. I'll just go to church. I'll read your word. I'll just spend some time in prayer. And, um, 
And as I got to the church, um, your chapel came to my mind. I think you have chapel on Thursday mornings. And that came to my mind. And I remember talking to Tamara a while ago and I thought, oh, I should go. Like I should just drive up to Rainbow, go to the, to the chapel. But it was just after 10 o'clock and I quickly looked on the website and it said till 10.30. And so God just prompted me to do that. And, and I just thought, oh, man, by the time I drive up there from Bridgman Downs, so a dead set be nearly finished. And, but, I, but then I felt God say, no, just go anyway. Just go anyway. But I was like, no, nah, it doesn't make sense, Lord. Like, it doesn't make sense. Because it says here it finishes at 10.30. Anyway, so then I thought, I thought, oh, maybe I'll just ring tomorrow. So I rang her. didn't get through, obviously, because she's running the chapel, right? And, uh, and so I didn't get through. So I just thought, no, nah, is that me just saying that? Oh, I think it, it must just be me. It says here it finishes at 10.30, so I won't do it. And I didn't do it. And then I spent that morning just just involved and just stuff, just doing stuff. Then Tamara rang me back around midday, like 12 o'clock or something like that. And she goes, oh, Tweek, I'm so sorry, Mr. Cause is running chapel. I said, yeah, I know. And I said, funny, I felt prompted to come. She goes, oh, you're kidding. We only just finished. And this was at 12. And I was like, oh, no. Like, what did God want to say to me? Or what did he want to do, you know? And I missed it. I missed it because, I don't know, I just did what I thought was best or I did what I wanted to do. I should have listened. You know what I mean? I should have listened. Now, hopefully it wasn't too big a deal and maybe I'll come to the next one. Well, if it's God's will, we'll see. But, um, but you know, like that's, that's the thing. That's what we've got to do. We've got to just say, God, what's, what's your plan? What are you up to? What do you want to do today? And then walk in it. We've got to walk in it. Because you know what? God wants to bear so much fruit through your life. Like, he's got such an amazing plan. Like, our vision's small. God's vision's big. And he wants, he wants to unfold the bigness, the big plan for your life, not the small plan, not what you can come up with. We're, we're, we're very ordinary people, let's be honest. I'm, I know how ordinary I am. I'm very ordinary. I've got a small vision, small life. But God's got a big plan. He's got a big vision for my life. And I want to know what his plan is for my life. Not, not my plan, not what I've got in store. And the same for you. Why don't you step in? Why don't you step into God and say, all right, God, what's your plan? Because he's got such an extraordinary plan for you. And you'll never be fulfilled in your own plan. You'll always wind up being dissatisfied, radically dissatisfied. It's actually, yeah, okay. It's actually the, re- you, you've come this morning and you're looking at your life and there's a dissatisfaction deep within your soul, isn't there? And you just think, I feel like my life is mundane and I feel like I'm going through the motions. And God says to you this morning, he says, step into what I have because you'll never be dissatisfied in my will. You'll never be dissatisfied in in the plan that I have for you. And some of you have come and you thought, I hate work. I'm I'm unhappy in my marriage and my family life. And if you look at it, to be honest, it's all your planning. And God says, I've got a far better plan. I can heal your marriage. I can restore your family. I can bring your kids back to you. I can restore those relationships that have unfolded. There's unforgiveness in your heart. I can heal that. I can deal with all these things. And if, you've, if you obey me and if you walk in the plan that I have for your life, you will be fulfilled at the deepest part of your soul. That's what you need and that's what you want. That's the deepest desire of your heart, but only he can do it. And it is not going to happen out of your own plan. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So James says this, why? You don't, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. You don't even know. The amount of times I've thought to myself, I've schemed ideas and thoughts and plans. I've thought, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And God's up there going, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? How often have we done that? He says this, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Again, this is so prominent in my heart, but I'm often praying, God, help me to number my days. Help me to number my days. We've been talking a little bit about this in Connect Group recently, but my wife and I, Raquel and I, the other night, were just talking about, imagine if we knew next week it's all over. Like, imagine if we knew next week we're going to pass away. Like, would we do things differently? And again, you might say, oh, that's pretty morbid, but actually I think it's incredibly important because I think we reflected upon that we would do things so differently. My uh, Raquel's uh, had this opportunity just to connect with one of the ladies from our local school that our daughter goes to, and uh, she's very unwell at the moment. And, and Raquel was just saying, you know, as we were reflecting upon it, we just thought, if we knew last week, next week, sorry, 
it was our last day on earth. She's like, I would just like, I would just, just tell people, like, I'd just grab people and say, this is it. Like, you need to know Christ. Like, you need a kind of faith. Like, you need to know him. Like, we, we just reflected that we would probably live differently. And I think in a way it's kind of sad because I think that's how we should be living every day, knowing that our life is just a mist. It's a vapor. It's a vapor and it's over. And we need to live kingdom minor. We need to live with this, this sense, as James is talking about, it's a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I think we would be so much more fruitful. I think we'd be so much, you, we'd be used so much more powerfully by God if we live with that mindset. A kingdom mindset that our life is just a mist. Francis Chan does this illustration. I could have done it, but I won't worry because I don't know. I've probably, I'll probably use too much time. But he uses this illustration where he talks, he pulls this rope across the stage and he says, imagine that this rope is like your life, like, your, your, sorry, is eternity. He pulls this entire rope and then he has this little tiny bit of tape on this rope. He says, in light of eternity, this is our life on earth, this little tiny bit of tape and he pulls this rope across the entire stage. And he goes, that's crazy, isn't it? Because we spend all our time, our resources, our money on this little tiny itsy, itsy piece of vapour of a life when actually we've got all eternity to go. And the Bible indicates that how we spend our money and resources and time and how we live on earth actually impacts our eternity. And it's crazy because we put all this stuff, we go off all our time and resources and money and energy and everything in this little vapour of a life when we've got all eternity to go. It's crazy that we do that, but this is because we live with an earthly mindset rather than a kingdom mindset. We need to know that our life is a vapour. This is all we have. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, everything that is not eternal is worthless in eternity. Everything that is not eternal is worthless in eternity. And so he says the issue, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I, um, a couple of weeks ago, I saw this uh, thing by Angus Buck and I was just watching a devotional thought or something by him, but he was talking about John Wesley. And um, so John and Charles Wes- Wesley were so influential in one of the greatest uh, awakenings in all of history. He was, they were similar around the time of George Whitfield. And uh, there's a book, I can't remember the title of the book, but it's by Dallymore and it talks about one of the greatest awakenings. Now, Timothy Keller says that there has been no other book that has impacted him lo- his life more than on this George Whitfield book um, by Dallymore. And uh, I think I got it on audio book or whatever, but it's a fascinating, fascinating listening to uh, the awakening that took place with uh, Whitfield and then the Wesleys, they were a part of it as well. But uh, Angus was just sharing and, and I was really struck by it because I don't necessarily think through this lens, but he was talking about John Wesley. He wrote all these songs. He wrote all these books and he'd, he'd, he'd sold uh, all these books and things like that and, and accumulated money through these things. But he always gave it away, always gave it away. He had such a kingdom mindset that everything he did was for the kingdom. Even his money was always towards the kingdom of God. So he put all that money back into the orphanages they started and all these things. And many people came to faith through their ministry. But he lived with a mindset of this isn't mine. I'm simply a steward of it. He always given it away. And it's believed that when he passed away, when he died, he literally had nothing to his name. It's just a small, tiny bit of money, very small bit of money. Yeah, loose change, basically, uh, that he gave towards. He said, I just want to leave this for the pallbearers that take my coffin now. That's, that's it. And he had nothing else. Everything he gave, he went out leaving everything for the kingdom of God. And I'd never thought about it like that. I don't know if you've thought about it like that. But I always thought, because I was raised in a home that, you know, you, you've got to be financially secure. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for you to be spiritually reckless and you need to do God's will. What is it that he wants you to do and do it? But he had this, he had this mindset of like everything I have, I'm put it, pushing, putting back into the kingdom of God. Now, I'm convinced when he stands before God and, and God says, what did you do with my resources that I gave you, the money that I gave you, the time that I gave you? He's going to stand before God and say, I gave it all back into your kingdom, God. And God said, absolutely, good, well, done, good and faithful, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. But, but I, don't, I, haven't, I've, I haven't thought about that. I don't live like that. I live constantly with this sense of like, oh, I've got to accumulate more. Like I've got to have more wealth. And, and this is one of the biggest weaknesses for me. This is where Satan trips me up all the time is that I think my money's for me. I think my money's about accumulating and becoming financially secure. But God says, no, you're a steward. I've given you, everything you have is because I gave it to you anyway. You're literally a steward of it. 
And, and it's such a shift to go, oh, wow, like it's not for me, it's for your kingdom. And I hadn't thought about like that before, but so, so challenging. And so he says, what's your life? It's a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis. We need this kingdom mindset. And he says this, another quote by C.S. Lewis, but he says, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world are just the ones that thought most of the next. It's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? But he goes on to say, the apostles themselves who set on foot in the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. He says it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. It's challenging, isn't it? Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And so James says, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. The crux of what James is saying here is this. You need to know God's will and then walk in it. I think it was Smith Wigglesworth or one of the, the, the greats, but he says this. He says, know the will of God, confer no longer with flesh and blood and do it at all costs. So know the will of God, confer no longer with flesh and blood. In other words, you need to discern and know in your heart, this is what God wants me to do. Now, when you know that, and you've probably had moments like it before, and even now this morning, you know there's been things in your business or in your workplace, in your home life that you need to change that He's wanting you to do. When you know what He wants you to do, don't, don't confer any longer with flesh and blood because you know from the creator of the universe what He wants to do. You don't need to speak to anyone else anymore. I, what I do, I know I've done this, sometimes I speak to other people when I want to get out of something. So, so what I do is I know God's will, but I don't want to do it. So I just go, hey, what do you think about this and that? And then what happens is, and, and these are godly people, but, but they just say, oh, well, you know, maybe you should be wise about it and all this sort of stuff. And I go, brilliant, that's my out. But, but, but you know what I mean? When you know God's will, you just got to walk in. He says, confer no longer with flesh and blood. Don't speak to anyone else anymore. You just need to do it. And I often talk about this, even slow obedience is still disobedience. If you're a parent here and you've asked your children to do something and when you get to the 10th time, you're frustrated, not happy when they eventually do it, you know, half an hour later. You, and God says when he wants you to do something, he says, just do it. He wants you to do it then and there. And so we need to know his will and walk in it. Instead, he says, instead, you ought to say, if it's a Lord's will, we'll live and do this or do that. We need to wake up every morning and say, all right, God, what's the plan? What's the plan for today? See, some of you, you go to business, you go to work and you, you dislike your job, you dislike what you do and you just think, I don't, this is my life, this is what it is. But actually God has you there for a reason. We don't often think like this, but he has planted you there for a reason. He's saying, I'm not planted there. I just got this job because, you know, I just was desperate and all this sort of stuff. No, no, no. The person that you sit by, he's got, he, he wants you, he wants to use you to speak into that person's life. He wants to use you in that business. He wants to use you in, in whatever you're doing, the very house in which you live. He wants to use you to impact your neighbours and your street and your suburb. He wants to use you. But what we need to know is, okay, well, what's the plan then, God? How are we going to do it? And then walk in it. James says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. It's so, I realise it's so easy to do this. In our own plans, we boast about things. I've heard people talk about, oh, their five-year vision, their 10-year vision and what they're going to achieve. And, and we can do that easily. It's very minimal accountability. You can just make up anything, really. Oh, yeah, like in 10 years, I'm going to be turning over 100 million a year, you know, like that's what I'm going to be doing. And I mean, you know, you can say whatever you want, really, can't you? And I mean, it looks awkward after a while because your friends say, oh, yeah, he's the guy that's always going to do this and going to do that, the going to guy. And uh, so after a while, you kind of get caught out. Your integrity is really lost. But, he, but James says you can boast about whatever you want. You can boast about all your arrogant schemes. But he says all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin for them. In other words, that's like, man, take up with James. I'm just, I'm just the messenger, you know. Um, he says, if you know, like if you know what God wants you to do, if you know the good that God wants you to do and you don't do it, um, and you don't do it, 
He says, all such boasting, sorry, uh, it's a sin for them. Really strong language, but such a challenge. So what has God called you to do? God's laid something on your heart. It's in your business. I don't know, like maybe, maybe for you, you're involved in sort of, maybe you're, you're a, a mechanic or car sales or car salesperson, something involved in that space. And God laid something on your heart to do in that space. And and you kind of put it off or haven't thought about it. Maybe you've thought maybe in years gone by to start some sort of ministry. Maybe it's like dancing or you're a dancer. And you thought, how could God use this of all things? But, but God has a plan and a purpose in that. And, you, and, and maybe you've put it off and you haven't uh, jumped into it. But God says, I want you to do that. Uh, maybe for you, it's even in ministry. See, this is the scary thing. It can be in ministry. You can be so busy doing stuff for God, but not actually walking in his will. That's a scary thought just doing stuff for him. And, and you know what? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read this, actually. I got this word yesterday, this scripture yesterday, I felt prompted to share. This is in John 17, 4, but it just relates so much to James. And this is Jesus speaking here, right? John 17, 4 says, I have glorified you on earth. This is Jesus speaking, talking about his heavenly Father. He says, I've glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. You hear that? Jesus says, I've glorified you on earth. Now, how did he glorify his heavenly father? How did Jesus? Now, he's the, he's the one we look to. He's the one that we are following. He says, I've glorified my heavenly father on earth. By how? How did he do it? By accomplishing the work that God gave me to do, that you gave me to do. That's how he glorified his heavenly father. He didn't go about doing just good things for his heavenly father, thinking, oh, look what I did for you, God. And gets before his heavenly father in heaven and it's just like, oh, yeah, I kind of did all these good things. That, that wasn't what he did. He glorified his heavenly father by doing what God, his heavenly father, told him to do. Don't go about just doing good things, as James talks about here. Don't go about just being like, oh, I'll do this for you, father. I'll do this for you, father. Imagine that. This is, this is my fear, right? My fear is that I would get to the end of my life and that guy would look and say, okay, what did you do? Like, what did you do? What did you do with the, the money I gave you, the resources, the time, the gifts I gave you, like your talents? Like I gave you those. What did you do with all those things? I said, God, I, like standing before God going, I did heaps of stuff. I did all this stuff. I ran these events and these programs and I did all this stuff. Imagine getting to the end of your life and going, I did all these things. And God says, yeah, I know you did those things, but I never even asked you to do that. Like I never asked you to do those things. That would be incredibly, incredibly sad. Now here's the thing. Don't, don't do it. Let's not get to the end of our lives. And God say, what'd you do? And then you say, well, I did heaps of things. And he goes, yeah, I know. But it was nothing that I asked you to do. It was nothing I asked you to do. Now for some of you to say, you know, you, you're, you're unwell. A lady came up to me a couple of weeks ago and she said, you know, I appreciate your sermon so much because I preached this a couple of weeks ago in our church. But she said, I'm really sick at the moment and I feel like I can't do anything. You know, I feel like all I can do is pray. And I said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The spiritual, um, the, when we, we go to heaven one day and God lays it all out, the spiritual victories that we have seen on earth is probably going to be because of prayer. Like, it's not because we jumped in and tried to do it in our own strength. It's because the power of prayer. It's not a part of the ministry. It's the main ministry. Prayer is where it's at. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. Your call may be prayer. And it is the most significant call. And if you prayed your entire life, and God said, what did I do what I gave you? And you said, I prayed. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I asked you to do. That's the key. Let's be a people that walk about on about the Father's business, not our business, but on about the Father's business. Father, thank you for your word this morning. It's so powerful. And Lord, as I kind of shared before, I just felt, um, just in the prayer time before the service, I just felt, God, that, there was some significant things that you wanted to speak to people about. Um, and it was in the business realm, someone here in business, and uh, they're great at business and brilliant entrepreneur, no doubt about it. 
uh, but it's not their plan and purpose and you're calling them to say, hey, I want, I want you to hear me in this and what I want you to do with the business. For some here, it's, uh, it's a ministry, it's in art or it's in dancing or it's in, in the creative space and maybe they've been working in that space and uh, Father, you're just saying to them, hey, I, I want to lead you in this, I want to guide you and I want to use you in that space but you need to know my will and my plan for it. There's some here that uh, you're calling to be generous. Maybe it's around finances and around time and they know that they need to surrender that to you. Uh, finances, time. And Father God, I, I just pray that you'd give them the courage to surrender that to you right now. Actually, maybe in this moment, just as a response to God, that's fine, you can just stay seated. Maybe with eyes closed and heads bowed, you know that you've been spoken to this morning. You, you, your heart's beating and you're thinking, oh, I know that's me. There's stuff that you need to surrender in terms of finances and time, stuff that you need to surrender around your business, stuff that you need to surrender even around your own house and your property and uh, situations that are going on. You know what it is. It's really between you and God. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender that to Him right now. If you're open and you're willing, you know who you are. I'm just going to invite you just to put your, you can just move your hands uh, out in front of you, maybe sitting on your lap or whatever, but with your palms facing up as an act of surrender. No one else needs to see or anything like that. But in this moment of prayer, just go, okay, God, I want you to visualize those things in your mind that you know that God's calling you to surrender. And I want you to just place them in your palms and say, here you go, God, I surrender it. I want you to visualize kneeling before the cross and just laying them at the cross and saying, God, forgive me. And actually, I want you to speak to Him in this moment. So just in your head and in your heart, just ask for forgiveness and say, God, I'm sorry, I, I need to re-surrender this to you. You can do that now. I'm going to give you an opportunity. For God, God, thank you for the way that you speak to us. And even in this moment, a holy moment of surrender. The best thing that we can do with our lives is give it over to you. Because I'm just convinced that you can do a far better job of my life and our lives, far better job of it than we'll ever be able to do of it. And I just ask for forgiveness this morning. We actually just repent because we're so sorry because we thought our lives were about us. And it's actually caused so much destruction, so many broken relationships, so much unforgiveness. So much destruction in families, great God, because we were selfish and we thought our life was about us. And we just want to say sorry this morning. Please forgive us. And we just repent and say, Lord, we surrender it back to You. And what we need is a new heart. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, that You'd fill us afresh in this very moment as we lay these things before the cross, that You'd just give us a new heart, not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh and a heart and a desire to say, God, we're sorry. And what you want to do in us is so much better than what we want to do in our own lives, great God. And we look forward to the plan and the purposes that you have for us, not that we have. And so God, we just take this moment. And even as we sing these words, we just take this moment to continue to surrender, lay it before you, great God. Continue to speak to us, we pray, Father. Do a new work, do a new work in our hearts and in our lives, great God. We worship You now. We worship You in Your precious Name. Amen.